I look forward to sharing this uh, half hour together with you. Uh, you see our theme. We're looking at this rather obscure person in Scripture, Jabus. But he has been our example of someone who broke free from limitations. And I felt this would be a prophetic word this week. And we've been talking about that the whole week, the limitations, the things that hold us back. And I'll be break free. We have two, uh, two parallel paths in these programs this week. We're dealing with this because it's, it's a word that people need to hear. And uh, uh, I think the Lord has illuminated this scripture by Jabez to me. And then secondly, we're talking also about the plight of persecuted Christians. Almost 200 million, some say even more than that, Christians live in areas where they are persecuted for their faith or their faith is denied. Even some are killed for their faith and we're doing something about it. Tyna is with me here today. Tyna, nice to see you again. Yes, nice to see you. You know, you were with me on the program yesterday and, and I kind of finished by saying it's not about your worthiness, it's mm. not about your belovedness. Right. It, it's not whether you are worthy to receive, that you have become good enough, but it's about your belovedness. And I know that's probably not even a proper word. I made it up. <laughs> you are the beloved of God. And then you made a comment about that. And, and I'm not going to try to re-say what you said, but you made a comment to me. If it's still there in your mind, share it with us. Yeah, I said that, well, we cannot give what we haven't received. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, many of us... Um, you know, are fortunate to have great childhood and a loving childhood. Some of us, we didn't have that. And for some people, it's very difficult to understand what love is. And when we say that God is love, it can be very twisted version of love. Well, which isn't love at all, but like uh, people, some people cannot see and understand what it is. And what, what is it when we say God loves you? Mm -hmm. and what what love is so we cannot give what we haven't received and now for you and i think i know what the answer is is an experience it's not the word mm. god loves you it's to experience god's love yes was that something that profoundly affected you oh yeah it was when i came to the lord or um yeah it was his love his grace that sort of just crapped me and 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 I kind of almost desperately took hold of it um, myself uh, when I saw what, what is real love uh, and, and how important as human beings that love is. You know, that's why I've been saying, don't divorce yourself from Jabez's life, mm. though he's from 3,000 years ago, because his prayer was, oh, God bless me indeed, like for mm. real. N yeah. not, 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 not as a theological nuance of, right. a, of a theological concept. Yeah. Well, I'm going to come back to you with that, but I'm going to get <laughs> on with it here because I've been running out of time every, every day. Let's read the key scripture again. Jabez was more honorable than his brethren, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bear him with sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory and that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted that which Jabez requested. We've been talking about how his name was pain. And there was something very traumatic and painful that, that gave him that name. Maybe you have something that you think about right now that has been traumatic and painful to you. And so I'm not going to go back over that teaching. It's available on our website, I'm sure. But I want to focus on just three of the prayer requests that, that once Jabez had this revelation, God is for me. God, uh, God is real. It's not just something I hear about when I go over to visit the Jewish tabernacle. It, it, it's, it's real. That, it's, it's, people can go to church their whole life and it's, they, they hear things and they sing songs and they, they, they go through the motions. But when it becomes real. So the first thing he had prayed was, God, that you will bless me indeed. I talked about that yesterday. And then he says, enlarge my territory. And I would submit, we're not talking about physical land here. Land in the Middle East is not the issue of this teaching. Now, Eden, the Garden of Eden, had been, if you wish, a blessed territory. 
And Adam and Eve were expelled because they wanted to go their own way. And in a sense, when God promised land to Israel, the promised land was a restoration, if you wish, of blessed territory where the Messiah would be born. And then each tribe of Israel, they had a peace. It wasn't title deeds and land claims and buying and selling real estate like we know today. But every family, according to the tribe, had, had land. It wasn't theirs to sell. That's why at the year of Jubilee, everybody went back to the land that they had maybe lent out to pay off some debt. So we could say like this, that the territory of blessing for Israel depicts our inheritance under Jesus Christ. If, you know, if you were a Jewish person, on your plot of land that belonged to your tribe, you would work out the blessing of God. And for Jabez, our, the key person we're talking about here, he saw himself as pain and sorrow and he, misfit, an accident. Maybe he forfeited what he could have enjoyed. He lived in a cramped situation until he was awakened to this covenant with God. And he said, I'm going to possess everything that God has meant for me to possess. He awoke to the realization of what was his. Oh, that's so powerful. I said, Jabez woke up to a realization of what belonged to him. That's what we're talking about, this revelation of Jesus Christ. People know, oh, I know about Jesus. I know about the Bible. But when you wake up to the realization of what's yours in Christ, your territory is everything that Christ has provided for you. Think about that. Ooh, we could do a whole... Bible school course, not a course. It could be years of study, what Christ has provided. But what I'm saying in this prophetic telecast, take possession of your territory. Uh, it, it, because in Christ, you deserve everything that God has provided for you. See, the, the way the Lord, the people of Israel had a piece of land, but then this expression came quite often. The Lord is my portion. That's prophetic about us. You know, we don't only have some piece of land and say, this is our promised land. That's not even what's, what we're talking about today. We're saying, the Lord is my portion. The Lord is my territory. I have God himself. You know, salvation is fellowship with God. You know, God refers to us as we are his people. And we say, oh, you're my God. You can say our God, but you say my God. And, and, and so it, it always was inclusive. You know, Adam uh, was to fill the whole earth. That's what it says in Genesis 1. Not just the promised land that we call Israel today. Abraham was chosen to be a blessing to the whole earth. Abraham's descendants was to be as the stars and on, on, in the sky and, and the sand on the ocean shore. It wouldn't fit all that into Israel, into little Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. Uh, no, it, it, was, it, it was meant to bless the whole world. And that's, of course, for the Jewish people as well. They have the same covenant we do in Christ now fulfilled. You know, when I say this, I want to emphasize something that you hear me teach about quite often. I'm not going to give you all the scriptures this time just to say that when it talks about the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham, Galatians chapter 3. So if you belong to Jesus Christ, you're Abraham's seed. You have something. You have received spiritual territory. The Lord is your portion. See, see, here's the problem. The great miscalculation is when believers think they don't have anything. Have nots. You know, in Canada, politically, we have talked about certain uh, provinces as have not provinces, and that's kind of shifting. Some of the ones that were thinking they were have provinces are becoming have nots, but I'm not going to go there right now. I'm just saying, how do you see yourself in Christ? You know, the people of Israel, at one time, they said, oh, we are like grasshoppers. You know, what, what's more pathetic than a grasshopper? I remember I don't always cut my own grass anymore, but I, for many, many years, I enjoyed cutting the grass. And, you know, if you had grasshoppers, and you're mowing your lawn in the summer, uh, you come there with the lawnmower, and, and the grasshopper just jumps out of the way. They, they, don't, they don't jump at you. They jump out of the way. It's like, excuse me. I'm sorry I was here. I was in your way. That, that's how the people of Israel saw themselves. Oh, excuse me. 
sorry that I exist. Their hearts melted with fear. And, and even some Christians have that kind of attitude and they think that's humility. No, it's not humility. The, the, the question is, what territory has God provided for you through Christ that you haven't yet possessed? And, and what Jabez is saying here, God, I want it all. Then he says, God, let your hand be on me. In other words, I don't want your hand to just be close by. I want your power, your ability. I, I want God at work involved with me. I want God in action now. I want, that, that's where it talks about the Holy Spirit fell on them. You know, the, the, the Greek word there's epipipta, which is like a bear hug. The Holy Spirit fell on them. Like the father, he fell on the son and hugged him. He, he says, that's what I want. I want God's hand, not, not close by, not at hand, but right on me. And then he says, God, let the cycle of pain be broken forever. Oh, this is a prophetic word for somebody. The, the, the way he said it was that it may not grieve me. It may not harm me. It, in Jabez's life, referred to that painful trauma that he had carried from his childhood. It held him back. It was a setback. Whatever evil, wrong, pain, ugly thing that caused unhappiness, that caused this substandard, poor quality life, it was the thing that held him back, that crushed his life. Maybe his mother had been morally wrong in dumping her pain on her son, but no matter how it was, she had her own set of issues. Jabez had lived in the energy of that evil, whatever happening, whatever destructive thing, whatever, it was like a poison, it was like a scar. You know, if you have a scar, it's a reminder of a pain. The scar doesn't hurt you, but the poison that's under the scar could hurt you. And so Jabez's prayer request was, God, I don't want any of the junk, the pain of the past to affect my present or my future. And that's what I'm talking about. Break free from a limited life. This is a prophetic word for you. Step out of this. And then it says, God granted his request and God has granted your request through Jesus Christ. And, and you know, when, when Jabez saw that, he, he just got happy. He releases his mother. How, how do you know that? Well, he doesn't mention anything else. You know, he, don't, he must have just forgiven her. So I, for, I, I forgive her. Because uh, there's nothing else to it, it, You know, to forgive someone is to release someone. It's not just to say, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. But to release it, let it go. Stay break free. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to say, you've been listening to me. The very first step to break free is to acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can see on the screen there some material they will send to you. You can just text me and say, I want to know God better. Peter, send me the free material. I will send it to you free and postage paid. We want you to have that. And, and I hope this teaching has helped you. Tina, any comment? I think Nathan is going to join us here on the set. But right now, any, any comment that you have from what you heard? Well, I just want to say that let's remember one of God's names, it's Alpha and Omega. Yeah. And when we were born, God was there. When we will die, God is there. And God is there in between every day, every moment. That's God in the now. I've been talking yes. about that. Step into your now moment. And we want to pray for you. You see how you can send the contact our prayer center, text me prayer request. You can go to peteryounger.org. This week, I've been showing little clips from an interview I did with Matea Murta, who is the Campaign Life Coalition's representative to the United Nations. So we got one more clip. Watch this. What about Europe? We think of Europe as a bastion of freedom. But are there parts of Europe where Christians are being persecuted or intolerance against Christians? Um, and I'm including Russia as well and the, the Eastern European uh, countries there. For sure. Well, let's start. We'll start in Russia. In Russia, um, recently there was arrests, arbitrary detentions, and then arrests of individuals in caucus. And um, uh, I'm thinking of one other one. Uh, it's escaping my mind at the moment. Excuse me for that. Um, but they were arbitrarily detained because they believe in Jesus and they're open about it. Mm. Um, 
even though Russia is Orthodox uh, Christian or Catholic uh, denominational, the government recognizes that Vladimir Putin has lended his support. Uh, Christians of any other denominations are most often uh, imprisoned or they lose their jobs. There's a lot of government pressure. If you're a Christian and you have a job, the government will um, force that, that employer to, run, to completely dismiss you. Um, and if we jump over to Germany, we're seeing the sim similar kind of pressures being uh, put onto Christians. And a lot of it has come from migration from other, um, other countries, we'll just mm -hmm. say that have completely different majority faiths opposing Christianity. And so Christians are most often attacked, their buildings are burnt down. Uh, and I recently read an article that Christians in Europe are being driven underground. Even in the UK, uh, the church is underground at this point, especially amidst, amidst the pandemic. So Christians are still uh, living out their faith, but they're, they are having to do it in a different way which is strange to us here in the Western world, but that persecution, if we do not talk about it now and expose it for what it is, it's only going to thrive here in where we live well, in North America. Well, one of the things I often say is that if we don't fight for the freedoms we have, we will lose them. So let me, let me maybe finish on that point, uh, because when you mention countries like Germany and the UK, of course, suddenly it feels much closer to home. It, yeah. it shouldn't in a way, but North Korea, okay, it's over there, Eritrea, many people, but, but we're talking about European countries that supposedly have the same democratic principles as we, we think it, we have in this country. What would you say, and uh, this program is pretty well, um, it, it certainly reaches Canada quite thoroughly, also outside of Canada, but let's speak to, to the Canadian situation. What would you say to Canadian Christians? Is there something we need to be alerted to, be aware? Could there be... Could similar situations develop here? I'd like to hear your take on that. Absolutely. Well, right now in Canada's uh, parliament, there is the heritage minister. And I'll just say that he is looking to uh, cut down on um, hate speech online. Mm -hmm. And so Canadian Christians, our, our faith could be deemed a hate a hateful means because we believe what the Bible believes and states that we are to follow and live out because it's for our flourishing that we do so and as well as the world around us but that is something that we need to look closely at is the the hate speech um, laws that are going to be coming into place very soon and so we have to be more localized uh, with our with our outreach um, because that's how we we have a greater impact. We have to think globally, but act locally. And that is how we continue to spread the message of Jesus. Um, but I would also encourage Christians in Canada to encourage your pastors. They have been through the ringer this year and, mm -hmm. uh, and they are continuing to have pressures upon them. But we have a mandate to continue to gather and to speak the truth and to live out our lives with that truth. And so I encourage your local fellow believers in your community, um, but also be aware that there are uh, nefarious agendas at play right now to silence your voice. I think, Matei, I want to have you back on to discuss just that one topic of hate speech and what is hate speech. I saw the same report you did. And of course, somebody could make the argument, if I just quoted Jesus' words saying, you must be born again, somebody could, I know it would be a stretch, but say, that's hate speech. Who are you to say this to me? And, you know, I feel traumatized by you saying that. Uh, that that's a whole other topic, but uh, uh, I'm glad that you alerted us to it. And I think we could do a whole other segment on that in maybe in one of the weeks to come. So thank you so much. I've been speaking with Matea Marta. She is the United Nations representative of Campaign Life Coalition. Thank you for spending time with us today. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. And I hope you'll see the whole interview that I did with uh, Matea. It's available on PeterYounger.org. That was just kind of the tail end. We've been showing the substance of it as she took us from one part of the world to the other and, and gave some valuable information. And um, very good to have, uh, we have a lot of good people from Saskatchewan. I got some on the platform over here uh, who are working with us in this ministry. And Matea is also from Saskatchewan, but working in New York City with the United Nations. Uh, Nathan, uh, not, not just in reference, let's not go down the road of talking about hate speech. I know we, we, we need to address that because there's this sense of persecution starts with intolerance and intimidation. Some of the things I noticed you've been researching a little bit as well as, as Matea took us to different parts of the world. 
anything that stands out to you when it comes to the, the plight of our brothers and sisters in Christ? I think that any crisis in general always births change. And I think that the crisis of the pandemic has birthed increased persecution. Statistics have shown that, 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 that areas where there was persecution, it is on the rise and it has ridden, risen dramatically over the last year. I think that's given, gives this focus of this ministry, uh, uh, even though we've worked and we showed, or showed throughout this week how we have been working throughout the, the years in some of the top persecuted countries, but to inc take another step with this action fund that we've taken on is so it's so important right now because the challenge is increasing dramatically, whether it be China, where, where, where the, yes, there are tr the uh, number of believers is growing, but the persecution is growing uh, quickly as well. Uh, but you see that throughout, throughout the world. The statistics show that one in eight uh, Christians in the world are facing persecution, and that, that's on the rise dramatically year over year. So now's the time to focus on that. And there's great pr pr uh, biblical pr precedent. Shut me, shut me down when you... But, no, no. but it, you see even in the book of Romans how Paul, uh, in some of his missionary journeys, collected funds for other churches who were, for example, the church in uh, Jerusalem that was poor, uh, and it was facing hardship at that time. So there's absolute precedence for doing this. Yeah, and, and I think when you're saying the reason I look like I had something to say there, you can keep going talking. I enjoy talking to you, Nathan, and listening to you, is we've done this campaign. They probably don't have it in the control room right now. We have reached this well over 40 million people in different language groups that we have reached, and I don't know if they have that. Uh, that's all right. And, but we have not been able to reach into China. We, we have produced programs in the Mandarin language because there's a lot of people who speak Mandarin outside of China, but that just shows you how restricted it is. Mm -hmm. we, we are able to reach Islamic countries, Hindu countries, Buddhist countries. We can reach all kinds of countries. Total freedom in these social media campaigns, but not China. Uh, so, so that tells you right there the limitations. Mm -hmm. We're doing something about it, and I think uh, th this video rather than us describing it. Let's watch it. It's about a minute and, and 50 seconds or so. Uh, and watch this closely. Stephen, the evangelist, was the first Christian martyr. Today, millions live in areas where their faith is forbidden or oppressed. Pastors are imprisoned, churches are closed down, intolerance is encouraged, and the gospel witness is often denied. Peter Youngren has seen firsthand the horrors of persecution and in his meetings with religious and political leaders, he presents the gospel and advocates for religious freedom. World Impact Ministries is launching the Stand with Stephen Fund with a two-pronged approach. One, to help Christians that are persecuted for their faith. When Shama and Shazad were brutalized and then killed because of their faith in Christ by being thrown into a furnace by an angry mob, World Impact Ministries was there to help the three surviving children. The brutal murder of Shaman Shasad moved me so deeply. These young believers lived close to where I had conducted a gospel campaign. They refused to deny their faith and they lost their lives. Second, the Stand with Stephen Fund will affect changes in governments. World Impact Ministries has entered a strategic partnership with the Global Advocacy Center with consultancy status at the United Nations. If a pastor is killed or a church is bombed, Government leaders are rallied to create pressure on regimes that tolerate persecution against Christians. Some of the work is by necessity secret, especially in countries where the gospel is forbidden. There are beautiful stories of pastors who were imprisoned but have been released because of this work. Your partnership with the Stan with Stephen Fund will help those who suffer for their faith. The work is ongoing every month. That's why monthly partners are needed. Please give your best gift and if possible, become a monthly partner. Call now, 416-745-1820, or go online to give.peteryoungren.org. As Nathan has referred to, we work in many of the countries that are listed as the top 10, the top 20 countries of most persecution in the world. We actually work in there doing campaigns, having Bible schools in some of those countries. I think what happened to Shama and Shasad uh, the, the brutality of that murder, where the mob of a uh, thousand people supposedly threw them into that kiln, into that furnace, uh, it's almost too grotesque to talk about. You remember when that news reached us, and then to realize we'd had a campaign not that far from where they lived. 
And, and yet we didn't know what to do because, you know, there's lots of people who will just give some food and maybe do some, and, and that's needed, of course. But I, I, I want to affect history. And so we, we, we partnered and said we want to enlarge our circle of love to include the Global Advocacy Center connected with the World Evangelical Alliance. And I, I found out how small means they operate with us. And maybe, maybe our partners would take this to heart and say, and, and I've heard some of the reports, by the way, you say, well, what are they actually doing? Well, they meet with leaders, sometimes ambassadors to the United Nations, other leaders, and are able to actually see pastors who are in jail freed. And I say again, we can't talk about it. I can't show their picture. I can't tell you in which country it was because some of the agreements to get these pastors released is that there's no details provided. But when we hear such reports that this could be the effect of our work, it gives me tremendous joy. And so if you would put it on the screen there, Stand with Stephen, the first martyr, what I need people to do is to give your very best gift, and we're going to put that right into this relief uh, of, of persecuted Christians, in addition to everything else. Are we reaching millions? Are we reaching more than ever? I'll tell you in the, in the, in the days to come uh, more about <laughs> awesome breakthroughs. I just can't bring it all into one program. I'm talking about awesome breakthroughs in the last few days as far as reaching millions with the gospel. And then if you are a partner and you say, well, I give $30. Maybe I can make it 40 and give 10 extra. Or if you say, I give, I give $80, I can make it 100 Thank you. Please, uh, you see there, they, they're showing you how you can do that. Uh, give online or, or write to me. Right now, let's pray. Father, I thank you. I pray that this prophetic word has touched many hearts to break free from limitations. And then I thank you, Lord, that you empower us to help those who are hurting so much to break free from the limitations that they just happen to be born into in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for the blessing that comes from lifting others. And so walk into this freedom. Let us hear from you a prayer request. Let us hear from you uh, praise reports of what God has done. And I look forward to talk to you soon. You are loved. Thank you. Your participation makes this global gospel ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the gospel to those who have never heard it, call 416-745-1820. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at P.O. Box 62039, RPO, Victoria Terrace, North York, Ontario, M4A 2W1 or P.O. Box 433, Winchester, Kentucky, 40392-9800. Together, let's give everyone a chance to know God's love in Jesus Christ.